Hi, this is Doug Goldstein. I just did an interview with Callum Thomas. I think you're going to really, really enjoy listening to it. You know, a lot of people try to find the best investment. And one of the things that they're missing out is the fact that it's really impossible to find the best investment. So what do you do? Callum has a company called Top Down Charts. He specializes in, well, as the name suggests, top down investing. If you want to learn what that means to look at things more from a macro level than just from a micro level, this is an interview you should listen to here on the Goldstein on Geld Show. You're listening to certified financial planner Doug Goldstein, host of the Goldstein on Geld Show, www.goldsteinongeld.com. Okay, I'm very excited to be talking to Callum Thomas, who is the founder and head of research at Top Down Charts. Top Down focuses on independent research, and actually a lot of that research is used by pension fund managers and institutional investors. Calm, I want to start with this question just to get the definitions before we really dive into your predicting the future. What does it mean to be a top down investor? That's a very good question. So, I guess one good way of uh, defining anything is to look at the opposite of what it is. And for a bottom up investor, they're the ones that are looking at individual companies, individual securities. Whereas the top-down approach is more of a, a broader, starting at the top, so what is the broader global trends, what is the trends in the individual country, and then, you know, even going down into what's the trend for the sector. And then, personally, I stop at that point because just the way I run things, but if you're sort of aligning that up with somebody who's picking stocks, they're probably going to take over at that point, and then once you've identified the country, the region then they're going to go down and find those individual countries. But, you know, the way the world is now with the various investment products out there, um, you can still actually invest at a top down at the bigger picture sort of country sector level versus going down to the individual company. The difference, I think, between the way people look at investing, the way you're describing this top down and bottom up, a guy like Warren Buffett, for example, when he invests he focuses a lot on the individual company. He looks at the management. He looks at what they're doing. He really digs in deep because that's something that you can really understand. How can someone, and I understand this is your whole business. I'm sure I'm not insulting you by asking, but how can someone possibly understand the, the big picture at such a huge level when we talk about macroeconomics, which is really so macro? Yeah, it requires a few things. And I guess another question there that some other people would probably ask too is how can you do that as a one-man band, which I am, and the answer is by focusing on the data. I mean, you know, I've got lots and lots of spreadsheets here, multiple different charts, monitoring a lot of different series, and, and while you look at a lot of different information series, there's also this part where you begin to build that up into an aggregated overall picture, which, you know, it's not like you're out there reading the news and trying to get an overall sense for what's going on. You're looking at the specific data, indicators, which help you build up that picture. There is a lot of skill and human element in actually interpreting the data, but being data-driven, I think, solves a lot of problems on that front. So I like data as much as the next guy, and I do like to find figures. And when I look you know, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor. I do the radio gig once or twice a week. And generally, I'm talking to people about the specifics of their investments. How much money do they have? How much money do they earn? What are their expectations? But when we start to talk about big picture issues, when I talk about it, I'm talking about a person looking at his own big picture retirement plan. But again, this is still very localized. I'm wondering, when you look at global events or global economic issues, how do you deal with possibilities that really do come up? Things like war and famine or 9-11 or on the good side, you know, a new invention that's, that's a real game changer. How can you build that into your data to make it continue to be useful? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess zeroing in on the geopolitical aspect, there's a couple of things you can do. The first one is looking at the history and trying to find events that might be somewhat similar or comparable and then looking at how that impacts the markets and you know I think a lot of the time and there's always going to be exceptions but a lot of the time when you get some geopolitical event happening like you know the start of a war 
for the most part, for most markets, it's going to mean a short-term shock. And that's where the big picture view becomes quite important because if your belief is, and that belief is justified, that the underlying economic trends are still fine, then what you're most likely going to see is a rebound or a bounce back. And so there's two reasons why that's important. First of all, you know, that you don't get panicked and sell it at the bottom. And the second one is that you rebalance or you deploy cash when you find opportunities. It's about keeping a cool head. And when you're taking this top-down 10,000-foot view, you tend to be able to have a cooler head. And certainly if you're you know, focused on indicators, data, you can actually have a bit of a cooler head. And then the other thing too is looking at whether the market is, or whether risk indicators are actually factoring in that possibility. And I guess if you're looking at the markets and you're seeing that valuations are very high, that risk pricing is very complacent, and your judgment is that the risk of some geopolitical event is very high, then that's the type of environment which you tend to think about decreasing your risk exposure. I mean, it is very important to translate these things into the real world and you know, practical implications because you can sort of get lost thinking about interesting things. Right, too much theory. One of the things you said, which sounded, I think, a little bit like something I say to people, is you use the word rebalance or redeploy assets. The term that I use with clients is we talk about asset allocation. A guy like you who's really looking at the big picture, is it important to you to engage in asset allocation as well? Or are you happy to take a position and say, you know, I believe XYZ is happening in the markets and I'm going to put all my coins into that basket? Yes, i um, very big believer in asset allocation. My clients are all big asset allocators that pension funds, etc. And so, you know, I used to work in directly in that and it's the biggest driver of your returns. And... The reason that is, is because at the heart of the asset allocation, the decision is what proportion of your portfolio have you got in risky assets versus assets that are usually less risky. When the risky assets are not doing well, that's when the less risky assets do their job. And when the risky assets are doing very well, they're the ones who produce the returns for you over the longer run. But I think that there is definitely a place and a lot of value to add by being active in the asset allocation as well. So what does that actually mean? People talk about this active asset allocation. I think that there's really two ways that you can think about it. The first way is from a risk management standpoint, and that means adjusting your asset allocation with risk at the heart of your decision making. That would mean as you see various indicators of risk rising in the market, valuations becoming very high, sentiment becoming too optimistic and economic fundamentals starting to deteriorate, then you would start to decrease your weighting to anything that's exposed to that. And that means, you know, selling stocks and either putting that into cash or bonds. And then the other take on it is being just trying to boost the returns and being a bit more aggressive about it. And that's looking perhaps within the buckets, you know, if you think of asset allocation as putting money in different buckets. So looking at the stock market bucket, you know, you might think, do we just put everything into global equities and take the easy road? Or do we go around the world and try to find the best markets and try to find a couple of countries that are going to do 20 or 30% versus 10 to 15% for the global market, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, we have certainly gone around the world, Callum, by talking to you all the way in New Zealand. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time today. But tell me in the last few seconds, how can people follow you and follow the work that you're doing? Yep, just Google top down charts. You'll probably find us on Twitter. So quite active on Twitter and LinkedIn. And we've also got a blog. Those are probably the key ways that most people can follow us. And, you know, if you're interested in looking at some of what we do a little bit more closely, then send us a message via the website. Okay, we will put a link to all of that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Callum Thomas, thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with money maven, Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. 
If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com.